不可了生脱死，离苦得乐，素真无生。Will the Sangha with great virtue, out of compassion, for the sake of the subassembly and all living being, please turn the wonderful Dharma wheel to teach us how to leave suffering and attain bliss. And end birth and death, and quickly realize number. Namu Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa. Namu Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto sucedo ye olahudi samyao samputoshi. Namo sadanto sucedo ye olahudi samyao samputoshi. Wu Shang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa by Qian Wan Jie Nan Zao Yu. Wu Jin Jian Wan De Shou Chi Yuan Jie Ru Lai Zhen Shi Yi. Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. 好的，师父上人，各位师兄，大家阿弥陀佛。Venerable Master, welcome again to everybody to our sutra lecture today. It's not a sutra lecture; it's a presentation of a wonderful document prepared by our teacher, Master Shuenhua, back in Hong Kong. And before we get into today's lecture, let us. Move forward into our protocols, which include management of country. That is to say, we respectfully act region as traditional storytellers and custodians of the land where our monastery is located. We pay respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and to all First Nations people whose sovereignty was never ceded. 就是说，我们恭敬地承认，啊，有刚被遗嘱的公布马里人，是我们寺院所在地的传统叙事和守护人。我们向过去、现在和未来的长者们致敬，并且向从所有从未放弃主权的第一民族的原住民致敬。All righty, well, there we go. Hey, um, just to let you know. That today is Saturday, January thirteenth,、uh, here in Australia. It's Friday, the twelfth of January. We're almost halfway through the month of January. Can believe it? Can you believe it? In twenty twenty four, hope all of you are experiencing a pleasant New Year, staying away from COVID and recovering from earthquakes, and、uh, not hope that no. Military shells are falling on your heads where you're listening.、Um, this is a difficult world, a difficult time in the world. But studying the Dharma is certainly one way to help us make sense of it. And by the way, if it's too hot in here, kui kai lom chi. If it's too hot in here, it is too hot in here. Can you be patient? Okay, it's, it's sweaty. Well, yeah. Okay, kui. How good. We um. Today we're experiencing 80 degree weather, 80 plus, almost 90, and、uh, negotiating the trade-off between loud、uh, air conditioner noises and the purity of our broadcast. Ha! Anyway, in any case, we are grateful for our translators who make it possible for my words in English to go out to your ears 
in Chinese. Uh, uh, interpretation. Chinese. 可以了, 可以听中文, okay? And if you'd like to hear Vietnamese translation, go to our chat box. You will find Vietnamese translation link right there. Furthermore, if any of you uh, let's see here. Is the original sound on? Yes, it is. Original sound is on. Uh, if any of you would like to request Dharma, like uh, we just had our friends from the girls' school, Wang Yidan, together with her friends, uh, there is a link, uh, an, an email address in the chat box. Send an email and you can request Dharma. If you can only do one language, we can help. Uh, in the past, we have had Dharma requests from Sao Paulo, Brazil, from Hanoi, Vietnam, from Pinole, California, from City of 10,000 Buddhas, from uh, on the phone, from Gold Coast, Australia. So we're delighted to encourage people to create incredible merit and virtue for future lives. If you, by uh, daring, I mean, it, it's kind of nervous making you, you're there, you know, your voice is going out to currently 71 different people. Usually by the time the lecture is over, we'll probably have a hundred. And by being willing to do that, to, to go past your comfort zone, the result is people get to hear the Dharma. Oh my goodness. In the future, the merit and virtue from that act means you will get opportunities in the future to meet good teachers, to hear the Dharma, doors will open to you, you will find wholesome Dharma friends, and your chance for, chances for wisdom to grow just seem to come spontaneously, naturally to you, as a result of your own uh, willingness to help others hear the Dharma. For example, today we have friends gathering. Let's see, here where I'm sitting, we have friends from China, from Malaysia, from Hong Kong, from Taiwan, from Australia, from all over the world, from Germany, my goodness, all kinds of Dharma friends are here in person listening to me speak. From Singapore, Singapore, how did I leave out Singapore? And online, my goodness, uh, we have friends, our translator is here in the Gold Coast, we have friends from Ukiah, from, is that us? Shubhashu woman. There we go. Yeah. From Vancouver, British Columbia. From Sydney. From Cascade, Colorado. Oh, up in the mountains. From San Leandro, California. Campbell, California. From, let's see, Christopher is out in the far northwest. Connie is in Sunnyvale. Gong is in San Jose. Saratoga. Hi, Cynthia. Montreal. And we have to say it all together. La Belle Provence de Quebec. Right? Montreal, Quebec. From where else? From Alameda, Guangdong. From Jakarta, Indonesia. From Round Rock, Texas. Malaysia. From Los Angeles, San Rafael, San Jose. Uh, somewhere in Ohio. St. Petersburg, Guangzhou. Mesa, Arizona, Pinole. Sam is here twice. Sam, how do you do that? Fun Shen, amazing. From Santa Clara, California. From Seattle. From, let's see here, Virginia, Vancouver, Hayo, Santa Barbara, oh, Rahona, Beijing, Baoto, Neimonggu, oh, Harbin, oh, uh, uh, Hangzhou, Liaoning, Heilongjiang, Zhejiang, Shanxi, uh, Heilongjiang, Suhui, Haodou Difang, uh, Hayo, Nali, uh, let's see here, Beijing, Tangshan, Hebei, Nanjing, uh, Liangge, from Nanjing, Laida, Beijing, Shandong, uh, let's see here, oh, from Jinan, uh, Shandong, okay, Hayo, Shanghai, uh, Hubei, Suzhou, Shanghai, and 
Canada. There we go. All right, good stuff. Now, today, story today, it's a story that is quite unique uh, for monastics. This is a story from a monastic's point of view, particularly touching story for people who are holding precepts. And let's take a look. How does it work? Ready? The title is, uh, let's see here. Your internet connection is unstable. I beg your pardon. There we go. All right. 守戒,守戒律,不欺暗示. Upholding moral precepts, he was not misled in the dark. Here we go. Okay, people want to read with me? You want to try? Should we see if we can do it together? Starting here. Uh, our, our teacher is 38 years old. The year is 1877. The third year of the Guang, Guangxu reign of the Qing Dynasty. Right? Kind of hard to imagine that he's 38 years old back in the Qing Dynasty. And he lived to be 120. Oh my. Okay, starting right here with this phrase. Bai Shi Li Ho. Ready? Here we go. Bai Shi Li Ho. Cheng Chuan Fu Hang. Zhao San Tian Zhu. Ge Sheng Jing. Li Tian Lang Chang Song. Dang Da Chuan Shi Zai San Fu. Ren Duo Chuan Xiao. Gong Su Yi Chang. Yu Gong Wei Lin Pu. Nai Yi Qing Nian Nu. Ye Shen Shu Shui Yo Ren Fu Mo. Jing Xing Shi Zhi. Wei Luo Ti Nu. Ji Fu Zuo Chi Zhou. Ai Ke Bu Shen Yu. Okay, your Mandarin is improving, everybody, I must say. It sounds really good. Okay, ready. Now, can we do it again in English? Pay attention to. The punctuation. The punctuation is your friend. The punctuation is there to tell us when to breathe. And we don't get invited to read together. Most people reading in unison, we don't do it. And yet it's really a satisfying practice. It's fun to come together and read together and to hear the same thing you're saying with your mouth through your ears with other voices together. Um, this gives rise to a whole new uh, mode of unity in a, in a community. So uh, let's try, ready? We are gonna start right here after paying his respects. Okay, here we go. After paying his respects to the relics, comma, pause, the master took a boat to Hangzhou and visited the sacred areas of the three Tianzhu monasteries. Period, pause, breathe. He bowed to Dharma Master Tian Lang, bright sky, and Chang Song, tall pine. Period, breathe. It was now the summer, and the master once again traveled by boat. This boat was small and crowded. All the passengers had to sleep in common quarters. A young woman's sleeping mat was situated just next to the master's, period, breathe. Late at night, he was startled from sleep by the sensation of someone's hands touching his body. He saw a naked woman crouched beside him, so he immediately sat upright in the full lotus position and recited mantras. Holding the precepts of a monastic requires constant vigilance. Okay. Oh my goodness. Right? Here's our picture. There's the image. So, what's the story? You can visualize. Here is a monk. A monk wanting to travel. When monks are in the monastery, um, living together, everybody shares the same understandings. Everybody shares the same guidelines. Uh, men and women are separated. People who are holding bhikshu bhikshuni precepts include celibacy. That's a promise to 
to be uh, out to be without physical contact uh, so that you can maintain your inner energy uh, so that you can take that energy and transform it into wisdom. Everybody understands that there's guidelines and so for a monk or a nun it's very convenient you could say to to uh, hold your precepts and go through your day uh, doing all the things that people do in their lives alone we call it, what do we call it? Living together alone or living alone together. That's what a monastic community is. It's true for uh, Hindus, it's true for Greek Orthodox Christians, it's true for Buddhists, it's true for Taoists who are living in a monastery. This is how it's done. When everybody's holding, following the rules, it's very easy for the monks and nuns to uh, flow through the day and, and feel like day by day they're resolved to hold the precepts, get stronger. As soon as you step out of the monastery, that's where the issues arise, because why? The other 99.6% of the population doesn't share your same understandings about how they want to live their lives. Um, people are definitely social animals, and we live in a touchy-feely world, right? That's normal. That's the way most people live. In a family community, uh, there's, they don't, you don't think anything of sharing hugs, of uh, patting each other on the back, and, and uh, they're a very different relationship to personal space and to what you could call sacred space around the body for a monastic. So it's a challenge to go outside. And the, um, it's important for the monks and nuns to acknowledge that we are the outliers. We're the ones trying to live uh, a different relationship to the body and to our community uh, than the rest of the world. The rest of the world, we've, we came from our parents, from our father and mother. Uh, and yet at some point in the life of a monastic, he or she says, I'm going to walk a different path. And I'm going, this path involves a very different understanding of my own energy, what I want to do with my body. And if I use it differently, if I uh, look at the, my eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind in a different way, it is possible to transcend birth and death. That's the promise. And you could say this, this understanding is built right into our founding story. What, what is that story? You know, it's, it's a real basic um, understanding of the Buddha's own experience. What was it? So here's the prince, uh, Prince Siddhartha, who came from a powerful family in, uh, in India. His dad was king. That means his mother uh, would have been queen, although she died early. He was raised by uh, a wet nurse, an auntie. So ordinary social milieu came this experience that Prince Siddhartha had which was traveling out into the city and in a couple successive days he saw an old person that he had never seen before. He saw a sick person which he had been prevented from seeing. He saw a corpse. He saw a dead body which totally shocked him. He, he was not prepared. He had all the way to his, uh, he's already a mature young man, he had never seen old age, sickness and death. His father was determined to keep him from it so that he wouldn't wake up. Well, he saw old age, sickness, he saw death, and in the midst of that sudden awareness that he too was going to die at some point, here was the fourth, they call it the fourth messenger. And that fourth, fourth messenger was a cultivator. 
a man walking in robes, a renunciate, somebody who was an ascetic perhaps, who was different from everyone else that the prince had seen. And the prince said, what are you doing? Who are you? He said, I'm a cultivator. And what do you cultivate? Well, I cultivate the way. Well, what kind of way do you cultivate? I cultivate the way that ends birth and death, he said. And now we know the backstory. The backstory is this was actually a deva, a god from the Brahma heaven, who knew this was his chance to help the prince wake up. So the prince said, well, but who, who can do what you do? And the story goes, the deva said, well, anybody can and you will follow me, he said. Ah, suddenly from a very normal social background, this young man resolved to take a higher road. At that point, he thought, I want to do that too. I want to find out whether I can leave behind birth and death. Has anybody ever defeated mortality? That was the new challenge. That was his new project. And so it took him six years, but he did. He, at that point, said goodbye to his wife, who at the time was pregnant, as the story goes, said goodbye to the parties, said goodbye to the affluence and the comfort, to the power of being the leader of the army, uh, being the king in the future, he said goodbye to all of that and went out into the bush, into the wilds to figure out the answer to that question. Can birth and death end for people? Now, what he learned along the way was you don't beat the body up. You don't, like, it's not a question of mortifying the body. He tried. He got, he, he starved himself to the point where he was just skin and bones. And he couldn't even hold his head up when he was meditating because he, was, he would have fallen over. He didn't have enough strength to sit up straight. And he said, this is not the way. We don't mortify the body. We, you could say, mortify the mind. That is to say, we investigate the mind. So at that point, he started to eat just enough. Somebody had told him, you know, the reason why people die is because of desire, someone said. So the prince said, how do you end desire? Well, someone said, stop eating. Desire comes from food. Oh, okay. So he tried, failed. You can't force the body into liberation, into awakening. You have to find the middle way, which he did. And that middle way involved transforming his own, they say, jing qi shen, essence, energy, and breath. He learned through meditation how to transform that and became the Buddha. Ye du ming xing er wu dao. He woke up, saw a bright star, became the Buddha. And he saw a star in the sky. Ye du ming xing er wu dao. Woke up to the way. Now, from that time, the Buddha remained celibate. He said this transformation of energy requires, first of all, us to return to the fullness of our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. By transforming those through meditation, not running out looking at beautiful sights, not running out away from rejecting ugly sounds, but transforming those six senses that want to outflow into the world, transforming them in the mind. That was the key. That's the secret. Why uh, Buddhist monks and nuns from that time have followed the Buddha and been successful in that quest simply by uh, learning how to uh, learning how to, to handle desire and thoughts and emotions and intellect all those things you handle inside through taking charge of outflowing eyes, ears, nose, tongue and body so what the prince discovered was, indeed, it is desire that runs outside. And desire is a matter of thoughts, thoughts and emotions. So that's what he did. And so running that, that's our basic story, right? People know the story. 
Now, run it forward to the year 1877 to a boat from Hangzhou. Here is our monk, our Grand Master, Master Empty Cloud, traveling outside. Uh Uh-oh. Now, what happens when you go out in the world where not everybody's holding precepts and you're trying to hold the precepts? You're trying to follow the Buddha and control your outflowing energies, but the people around you uh, maybe see you in a different way. So here's the situation. Uh, what does it say here? Ren duo chuan xiao. People many, boat small. Wow, a lot of folks, uh, limited space. And because our monk is traveling tourist class, don't you know? He probably has just enough money to buy the, the, uh, uh, the, the popular, what do they call it? The, you know, what the, he's in the tourist cabin. So that's to say everybody's crammed in there together. If he had more money, which he wouldn't, monks don't carry that much money, he might have been able to get like uh, a, uh, a Pullman car on a train, you know, where you close the door. No, he's in there crammed in with everybody. And it's bedtime, it's night, and they don't, the, the people who run the ship don't have a, 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 a monk's room, a monastic cabin. That would be nice if they did. He's right there with a mat, uh, probably a rolled up straw mat. Right beside him is a very nice young woman, perhaps, who's just, you know, oh, here's a monk. You know, here I'm sitting next to a monk. I'm sleeping next to a monk. Well, the monk would be much happier if he were in a, you know, in a monastery, but what's he going to do? So, goes to sleep, wakes up at night, uh-oh, somebody is exploring uh, a monk at night. Like, that's not okay, that doesn't accord with my precepts, I'm afraid. So what does he do? Crosses his legs, sits in full lotus, and starts to recite a mantra. Here he is. Here's our monk. So, difficult, compromised situation. Um, what does it remind us of? It reminds us of the beginning of the Sharangama Sutra, right? People are familiar with that. That's a similar kind of story. In the Sharangama Sutra, the Buddha's cousin Ananda uh, is out exploring the town on his alms round, and a young woman sees him and likes the way he looks. Ananda is said was, was a very attractive young man, very handsome the best looking of the, the Buddha's uh, relatives. And this young woman sees him and says, ah, that's, I want to explore a relationship with him. The mom says, don't be ridiculous, that's a disciple of the Buddha. And she says, mom, teach me that mantra. You know, So mom can't stop the daughter. The daughter recites a mantra. Ananda hears the, it's, they call it the, the ancient uh, Fantian mantra. It's a mantra designed to put people into a trance. And he hears it and he does. And sure enough, he falls under the spell of the mantra. He doesn't have what Master Empty Cloud is displaying here, which would be samadhi power. And so the young woman says, Aha, let's, you know, uh, let, I'd like to get to know you a little better, she says. So at that point, uh, the Buddha sees the problem that he's about to lose, his disciple's going to lose his precepts. And so he sends Manjushri Bodhisattva to come bring them both back to the Jada Grove, where he speaks Dharma for them. Interestingly, there's a footnote. As the story goes, the young woman hears the Dharma and wakes up before Ananda. She she becomes an arhat very quickly. Her conditions uh, were, were ripe at the time. So that's, a, that's another story. But here's Master Empty Cloud, who, what is he doing? People could think, they could interpret this differently. Why is he rejecting this young woman? You know, uh, there could be a bunch of different interpretations of this. In fact, um, he, is, he is being completely consistent with his vows. Uh, Master Empty Cloud is, has sacrificed a lot to, uh, to the way, to his search for the Tao, to following the Buddha, 
doing what the Buddha did, the end, birth, and death. So he has given up his relationships, his family. He's, we know the story behind it, that his, both his parents are dead at this point. But he gave up the chance to be happily married. Uh, he let that go. His father was an official. Uh, Master Empty Cloud could have examined, passed examinations and become an official himself. He had a head start in the world. Uh, he gave all of that up in order to watch wisdom emerge in his mind. And at this point, to uh, explore a relationship with a strange young woman on a boat, not going to happen unless something, you know, unless she overpowers him or something like that. So people should not assume that monks are misogynist or uh, somehow, uh, you know, uh, antisocial or something. It's that he has different priorities. His, he has, uh, at this point, 30, 38 years. He's been a monk for 18 years. He's got 18 years of practice behind him. He's not going to let it go uh, for, what, sensation or a one-night stand or something. That would be entirely inconsistent with his vows and with his, his energy. So it's important how we interpret this. This is to say, here's a monastic who's living by a tradition that has been in the world for 2,500 years. It's a difficult job to be a precept holding monk or nun. It's, uh, it's not easy to hold, to hold those precepts, but the reward is from precepts comes samadhi. From samadhi comes wisdom. From wisdom comes an opportunity to end birth and death, to attain liberation from suffering of all kinds, to step out of the endless process of birth and death and birth and death and rebirth and death and rebirth and death, stretching out from the beginningless past into the endless future, lost in samsara, in confusion, in the dark. Here's an opportunity to step out of that flow of birth and death and all the suffering. Seeing old age sickness and death that the prince saw within a few days, uh, and you don't want to just blindly follow along. So that's what he's committed to. And of course, he's not going to toss that aside for some uh, strange young woman's fantasies. All right? So that's, that's what you're seeing, is this collision of lifestyles, of values, of a 2,500-year-old tradition face-to-face -face with, what, a night of fun? Uh-uh, not going to happen. Okay, so here we go. This is the verse. Master Hua gives us um, an, a four-line verse with every episode. This is a very powerful verse. Ready? Here we go. Tong zhou gong ji yu mo deng, bu liao jin gang dao ye shen, jia fu duan zuo xin zhi shui, ren er bian hua mei nai he. The master met Matangi's daughter traveling on the same boat. His vajra strength met the challenge. Deep was his karma in the way. He sat upright in the lotus posture, with his mind like still water. No matter the strange apparition, it could do him no harm. Okay, now we look at that, we think, wait a minute, wait a minute. What is this strange apparition doing him harm? It's just a young woman who was checking out a monk. Uh, uh, or was it? That's the question. Shurfu in his verse, is introducing another element to it that we might we might not understand. Here's here's my own experience um, to interpret this verse, which is what they um, occasionally master father. Occasionally, Shurfu would pull. Here we go. We're, this is a lot of technology is stacked up, so we just be patient. 
Shrifu occasionally would pose um, leaving home in a bigger context. He would talk about a cosmic struggle between good and evil. <laughs> big. He would paint it really big. And he would talk about the Buddha and he would talk about demons. Hmm, like that. And you think, oh, come on, come on. No, seriously. They, they talk, we say, you heard in, in, our, uh, in our stories here, we'll go back a few episodes. Here we have, uh, let me scroll back here, receiving the invaluable complete precepts. This was, he was 20, that was 18 years before. Here is Master Empty Cloud kneeling in front of the examining panel and becoming a monk. And we told the story there that when you become a monk, there is a moment when the, uh, the examining master say, Ni shi da jiang fu fao. And you answer, shi da jiang fu, right? Ni shi da bi chu ni fao, shi da bi chu ni, right? Are you a great hero or not? And the answer is, I am a great hero, a maha purusha, a great person. Are you a great bhikshuni? Yes, I am a great bhikshuni. The story goes, and of course, I don't see these things happening, but you can feel it in them. They say, when the candidate on the platform says those words, the palace of the demon king trembles and shakes. And at that point, the demon's following is lesser by one, and the Buddha's following increases by one. So it's a powerful moment. Now that sounds what? That sounds maybe uh, in the realm of fairy tales or mythological. Yeah, it is. That's very much like what it is. And uh, this, that's the kind of, you say, the larger significance of somebody actually stepping aside from the flow of desire and birth and death into the flow of the sage that ends birth and death. That's occasionally. Now, do, do monks and nuns walk around thinking, I, have, I am a great hero, I've left the, the demon's retinue? Maybe, maybe, but if you say those things and then you put them into practice in a daily basis. So it's a, you know, illustration of this principle. Uh, three Steps, One Bow, pilgrimage that I took along with uh, a colleague, Bhikshu Hung Chao, uh, bowing towards City of 10,000 Buddhas from Los Angeles. Uh, occasionally, Master Shren Hua would uh, travel down from Gold Mountain Monastery in San Francisco to LA. And we wouldn't know until somebody usually on a Friday afternoon, would pull up in a car. We'd be on the Pacific Coast Highway, somewhere far out in the boondocks, slowly bowing every three steps. A car would pull up. They would say, Sheriff was coming to LA. Mark your spot. Jump in. We're going down. You can spend the weekend uh, bowing outside the temple and listening to Master Hua speak Dharma. And we would go, ooh, hot diggity. Great. This is... We were waiting. We haven't seen Shurfu for 60 days. And, you know, these visits were more valuable than, than gold. So we would get in the car, uh, mark our spot, and drive south. Uh, Friday night, here would be Master Hua, and we would sit in there and just get tuned up, just feel like our, it was a, a check-in, you know. Was, we'd get uh, reset. And... This particular night, um, we were there listening, and at the end of the lecture, um, there was an unusual person in the audience, and uh, our practice was whenever the lecture was over, immediately, Marty and I would, uh, Hung Chao and I, would leave uh, we would, if we had something to say to Shurfu, we would speak to him. And of course, I was the translator. Marty didn't speak Chinese, so we'd have to wait there together. And then, or immediately, we would turn around and go out 
and spend uh, spend the night in our in our vehicle in our car that we where we slept in a station wagon sleeping sitting up and that was our practice we didn't stick around to talk to loso with anybody now this particular night um, there was this unusual person and she might have been 40, 50 years old, perhaps. She was uh, Asian, I think, probably either Chinese or Vietnamese, but she had dark glasses on. She had sunglasses, big, big sunglasses, covered most of her face. She had a strange hat on, and she was all bundled up in a sweater with a scarf around her neck. There wasn't she couldn't quite see exactly who it was, but there was definitely a strange aura about this person, an unusual kind of, I have to say, a dark cloud around this person. And I was ready to go outside and uh, to leave, leave the Buddha Hall and go out to the back where the car was. But Marty somehow had found himself in a conversation with this person. And I could see that the person was kind of getting closer and closer and closer and closer. And Marty was kind of backing up and backing up, but he was still engaged in his mouth. He was talking and he's, and I was upset about this because there was, this was not the way we do it. And there was something off here. And suddenly, Master Hua walked over, put himself in between the woman and Marty and said, no need to talk. He said, and he turned around and looked at this woman and she vanished. I have to say, in a, it was in a blink of an eye, this person was gone out the door, out the front door. And Shervo took the two of us, he, he grabbed both of us and pulled us in to his bedroom, uh, which was just off the Buddha Hall, where he would stay uh, when he came down to visit in LA. And he looked at Marty and he asked, he said, what, what were you doing? And Marty was like, uh, uh, Shrivo, I, he shook his head, I, I, uh, I don't know. Shrivo said, who were you talking to? Really strong, right? Marty, uh, uh, Shrivo, uh, she, she just asked a question. He said, you know who that was? Uh, I'd never seen her before, Shifu. He said, that was a ghost. She came to eat you, he said. And, and, and Marty was like, Koo! you know, just turned white and then red and then white and then red and white. And, and, and I'm translating. Uh, Shifu, did I hear that right? Shifu says, you, until you really know, if, until you can use your wisdom and see who is who, you cannot be careless. He said, you have to follow the rules. That's why I give you these procedures. He said, if I had not been here, I'm afraid that conversation would not have concluded uh, happily. So, and I'm thinking back, who was this person? You know, and we could, she was all kind of covered over, but you could tell there was some darkness there around. So anyway, so, so we went out uh, to sleep and we think, gee, it's good to have a good and wise advisor. This is not so simple. In other words, sometimes what you see is not what's really going on. And what's really going on is invisible. So who was this young woman here to investigate a relationship with the monk? Uh, maybe she didn't even know. There's a lot invested in getting the Buddha's uh, Sangha weak and reduced in number. The demons are very happy when people fall, that is to say, break their precepts. And this is true not only in, Buddhist, in the Buddhist Sangha world, but in the world of religion overall, that when there are scandals, when there's sad stories about corruption in the priesthood, or in religious faith, uh, it's, you could say, the darkness grows 
and the light of belief, no matter the religion, uh, dims a little bit. So, um, <coughs> who is this, this young woman trying to, to score on the monk? Uh, we don't know. Maybe she doesn't know either. It's possible that some negative energy thought, ah, here's an opportunity to get this virtuous monk to fall. Maybe so. Now, uh, another story that I want to share is at one point I was, they say, daily fang zhang at one point. I was the stand in abbot at City of 10,000 Buddhas. And I was, uh, you could say, a failed abbot. I did not succeed. Being abbot of a monastery is hard. It's hard work. You have to really work really hard. And so part of the job involves wearing the, the red robe and standing in the middle of the hall during ceremonies. You, ha you are the fajul, you're the Dharma host. And at one point in my time as the fajul at City of 10,000 Buddhas, there was uh, a young, uh, not so young, but a, a youngish woman. She was Malaysian, interestingly, uh, who would always line up on the bowing bench right beside my bench in the middle of the hall. No matter, it, it, according, she was wearing a, a robe, she was wearing a precept robe, uh, a lay precept robe, and according to where she should have been, she should have been about four rows in front, but she chose to put her bowing bench right beside mine. So when I was bowing in the middle of the hall, I was aware there was this person bowing just a couple feet away from me, consistently, for about a week. And uh, Master Hua did not spend every night, uh, every day at CTDB. He would go down to Gold Mountain Monastery in San Francisco and come up to CTDB on the weekends. This was a Saturday, and it was uh, after lunch. The after lunch lecture at CTDB was, I think we were studying the Shirangama Mantra, Lang Yan Zhou Ji Song, Lang Yan Zhou Shu. So, after uh, I was there and uh, helping Shifu translate, and as the, uh, as the Faju, I would be the last one in line to leave the hall. So everybody had left the hall except this woman who was, again, right behind me. And so I was going down the stairs. This is at Wu Yantang, the wordless hall. And I heard a scream from behind me. And here was Master Hua grabbing this woman and throwing her to the floor with force. And I'm like, uh, Ashurvo, why are you beating up this woman? And then he began to kick this woman. And I mean, with strength. Shurfu was a strong man, a Chinese monk. And he started kicking her. And he pushed her down the stairs out onto the sidewalk. And he continued to kick her. And she was screaming and crying. And Shifu was saying, Ni wo bu rong. Ni, How did he say it? He said, Ni bu kui chi wo de chu jia ren. Jie shi bu kui da. You can't eat my left home people. And this is forbidden. And everybody, so at this point, everybody is standing around and staring. And Shifu kicks her again with force, and she's screaming. And sure enough, out of her voice comes, out of her mouth comes a voice like, if people saw the Exorcist movie, how the demon speaks in a kind of voice, that was the sound this woman was making. And he, so... She ran away and uh, got in a car and drove away. And instantly, Shifu laughed and smiled. He said, actually, he said, uh, I was just chasing her demon away. This is, I was actually helping her out. She can cultivate more, more easily now. Who was that, by the way, said Shifu. Everybody said, we don't know, Shifu. We've never seen her before. So she just showed up last week, and she was standing right next to Hung Shur every day. And Shifu said, yeah, yeah. He said, actually, I... I might have saved her by chasing the demon away, but we'll see. Everything's a test to see what you will do. So 
So we were all shocked. We just seen our compassionate abbot beat up a Chinese laywoman, you know, physically beat her and kick her. And, and he said uh, she was unaware, but if I had not intervened, uh, we would have been one fewer abbot at City of 10,000 Buddhas. She would have uh, devoured Hung Shu and, and uh, broken his precepts. So I'm like, you know, I have no clue. I'm clueless. I have no idea what's going on. If it wasn't for Shurfu, how would the Dharma survive in, into the 20th and 21st century? So not so simple. Not so simple. What's really going on? Uh, sometimes we think we know. Other times we just we have no clue. This is not uh, softball. Demons actually do want the Dharma to fail in, in the world. So what do you do? You break the precepts of the monks and the demons have their, their strength grows, right? So that's, you know, for me to be able to tell you I know exactly what's happening here, I don't. I, but I was certainly witness to, uh, to situations like this. So to apply my own experience to the verse today, um, my guess is that this young woman was not to blame necessarily. Who was this evil person? Probably not. Probably it was some negative energy hoping to take an opportunity to have the monk break his precepts without you know, somehow he was overcome by what? By the circumstances or something? No, because, as Shifu says, His Vajra work in the way was profound. He crossed his legs, recited a mantra, and his mind was calm. Now, did he have thoughts of lust? We don't know, but it's when you say his mind was like was like water, that's a pretty good illustration that the power of his practice was able to transform any thoughts that he had, so that what? So his cultivation could continue. So that even outside in the world, for him, he was able to transform even a crowded boat into the stillness of a meditation hall for him so that the world didn't corrupt his practice and as a result some what uh, 23 uh, 150 years later uh, we go wow that's not easy that's not easy glad that he's got some samadhi and I have to say it's not for everybody not everybody is going to want to be a Buddhist monastic. Not everybody is going to want to be a precept holder. But the result of the story is we see it's possible for the worlds to coexist in harmony. You can be a precept holding monk in the world if you have sufficient samadhi. Um, even in the monastery, uh, my story, if it hadn't been for Shurfu, who knows what this strange woman wanted with me, like right there in the Buddha hall, lining up beside me, trying to get me to move my mind. Um, had my mind moved, uh, I wasn't really aware of what was going on. Shurfu, luckily, was very clear about what was going on and was able to not only keep me safe, but also help her wake up. Alrighty, there we go. Wowee, big drama there on a boat in Hangzhou. Um, we'll conclude today. These lectures last an hour. I want to thank everybody for uh, giving us an hour today. The Chinese is clear. Thank you. So, uh, COVID uh, saw the San Francisco Chronicle says Bay Area hospitals are full of COVID right now. It's the new, the new variant. So, um, 
I would like to recite Medicine Buddha's mantra by way of transference of merit. So you're welcome to join me. It's here on the screen. We do it three times. Uh, Medicine Buddha has made vows to uh, keep us, uh, to reduce the suffering. Not that disease goes away, but it's reduced to where uh, it's minimal, minimal harm. And when we're healthy, if we can recite his mantra, we put healing energy out into the world. Here we go. Please make a wish according to your, how you'd like your merit to go. Here are some images of the Buddha and of our teacher. I'm going to bow three times right from where I'm sitting. You're welcome to join me if you care to do so. Here we go. First bow. Second bow. Third bow. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. Alrighty, that's going to do it for us for today. See you all next week. Amitofo, everybody. Bye-bye now.